Let's go ahead and get started, everybody. Uh, my name is Eric Holthouse. I work as the City of Cedar Rapids Sustainability Coordinator. Tonight is our Community Climate Action Kickoff. Uh, and we're just about to jump into here. You're, you're seeing all the speakers uh, that will be joining us tonight and sharing their wisdom and their perspective uh, about community climate action. Um, and I'm gonna jump into my screen share here in just a moment and show you what the agenda looks like for tonight. So uh, thanks a lot for being here, everybody. Um, tonight at our Cedar Rapids Community Climate Action kickoff event, this is one of two. You are here October 22nd, a little past 5.30 p.m. We're gonna go till 7 p.m. tonight. We're gonna be recording this, sharing it on our website, cityofcr.com slash sustainability. We will have a second kickoff event uh, on October 29th during the daytime from 10.30 a.m. till noon. Hopefully you could join us at that time. Um, we'll have different speakers at that time. Uh, so we'll have four tonight and also our city manager. And then we will have four on that day as well, plus our city manager again, if his schedule allows. And so tonight we're gonna learn why climate change is important. We're gonna learn why community action is important. We're gonna learn perspectives from community members. And we're gonna find out what you can all do next in this uh, effort that requires us working together. It's a community climate action plan uh, and all of us need to be involved and kind of keep learning and uh, join on this journey uh, in whatever way we can, wherever we are on this journey. Uh, greetings, this is where we are right now. Um, thanks for everyone uh, for joining us. And I kind of went through a few of the folks, but thanks for city staff that have helped to make this event come true. Uh, Phil Plates, Amanda Rieger, um, a lot of our staff, our city council members, I know some of you and our mayor uh, had registered and are likely joining us. We have a lot of community members joining us um, and our panelists are joining us as well. So we're really excited that you're here. This is a really important and momentous event. I'm really excited for it. Um, and so how it's gonna work tonight, we're gonna move past the greetings here. Uh, we're going to get into some housekeeping items, how this event will work. We're going to get into introductions. We're just going to do event number one tonight. Uh, and we're going to introduce Carla Tweet Ball, Mark Weldon, Monica Vallejo, and Eric Tate. Uh, we're going to have a welcome from our city manager, Jeff Pomerantz. We're going to talk about community climate action. That'll get into the uh, after item number five. Uh, that'll be about the first 30 minutes of tonight. Once we get into item number six, each panelist is going to have about five minutes to present. That'll be about a 30 minute portion. And then in the last portion, uh, it will be a Q&A with the panelists. Um, and then after that, we're going to encourage you to take our community climate action survey, where we will, um, that's really going to be the first part in this effort where you can be involved, apart from educating yourself tonight through this event. Uh, we will be asking you, uh, community members, uh, what is important to you? Uh, how are you impacted by climate change? What do you get most excited about? Uh, what connections do you have in the community that you can share? What strengths of yours can we build off of? That is the point of the survey. And so we'll be ending with that. Moving into housekeeping items. Uh, anytime you'd like to share a question for the panelists, you can type it into the Q&A box. It is going to be at the end of the night that we get to those questions and answers. Um, that'll be about the final 30 minutes of the event. Uh, if you don't want to type a question in the box, but either because you can't or you'd prefer not to, you can also uh, hit the raise your hand button on the top of your screen. Uh, you've got an option for interacting or let's see here. Yep. Um, and so you can ask a question audibly. Uh, we will go ahead and unmute you if you have your hand raised uh, and we will try to get to some of those people um, who want to speak rather than write. Any questions that go unanswered, um, we will be posting the answers to those on our uh, city website. Uh, let's see here. We will ask the audience questions during the event as well. It's gonna be the next slide, I believe. Uh, so you can take quick poll questions and we can interact a little bit. Uh, the meeting is recorded and it will be posted to cityofcr.com slash sustainability. Um, and also we, there is a chat box and that is for questions or comments to event organizers. If you're struggling for some reason, if there's some function that may not be working, um, maybe we'll have an answer. There's a chance we won't know what the answer is, but we do want to hear if you're struggling and hopefully we can figure something out, either rectify it now or certainly rectify it for a future event if possible. So that is the housekeeping segment of our event tonight. Uh, moving on, 
So Sylvie is going to be helping with this. And I think that you will see a poll that pops up. Audience question. This is for everybody watching. Why are you interested in this event tonight? Are you uh, coming at this event for personal reasons? You can only choose one. Professional reasons. Are you a student? Um, or are you other? And as the results come in, it looks like we have uh, 20, 30 of 54 people have voted. Let's see here. Hopefully you're finding 34. Personal is about 60% so far. Professional. Oh, things are changing a little bit. Oh, maybe you can choose more than one answer. It's adding up that way. We're over 100%. So we have about um, 40 out of 50 people voting, 60% personal, about 50% professional, uh, about 5% are students, uh, and then about 3% are other family members, friends, people that are joining for social support. Looks like personal interest one with 26 out of 43 people responding. So I'm gonna stop sharing. So thanks for identifying yourself and finding out who you are. Uh, this is my first time uh, doing a big event like this. So figuring out how to make this interactive, make it interesting. Um, that's why we're doing these poll questions. So I enjoyed learning a bit about you. Uh, sharing results. Let's see here. So now I believe that you can see those. Okay. Thank you, Sylvia, for conducting that poll. Okay. Now moving on, uh, I'm going to stop my screen share here in just a moment, and I'm going to turn it over to Carla and then Mark and Monica and Eric. So one second here. Okay, I'm going to stop my share so we can see people's faces. I'm going to go back and I'm going to ask Carla, could you give a quick uh, state your name, what you do, who you work for, just kind of briefly? Absolutely. So I'm Carla Tweetball. I work for the Greater Cedar Rapids Community Foundation. I lead the program work there. So that involves our community leadership initiatives and overseeing the grant programs that we work on. So um, it's, it's sort of a, a good parallel to, to the conversation about the climate action work. So I'm pleased to be here. Thank you. Thanks for being here, Carla. Uh, Mark, we'll move to you next. Sure. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Mark Weldon. I'm a sustainability engineer with uh, Quaker Oats, which is part of PepsiCo. I've been here in Cedar Rapids for 12 years, and I have uh, responsibility for uh, resource conservation initiatives at six uh, Quaker plants in the U.S. and Canada. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, we're going to move on to Monica next. Hey, I'm part of the YPM, Young Partners Network. I'm I represent Guana. There's a neighborhood association, Cuesta area, and LULAC, Liga United Latino American Citizen. And very nice to be part of this wonderful panel. Thank you for being here, Monica. And then we'll move on to Eric next. Hi, my name is Eric Tate, and I'm a professor at the University of Iowa in the geography department. Uh, I teach on environmental issues and I do research uh, with respect to floods and I'm, I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Awesome, great. And Jeff, we're gonna get to you here in just one moment. Um, so before we get onto that, I'm gonna share that um, our next panel on October 29th is going to feature um, Liz Callahan and a student at Cedar Rapids School District. Um, during that next panel on October 29th, we'll also have Dara Schmidt the library director. Uh, we'll also have Mugisha Boenge with United We March Forward and the Westdale Area Neighborhood Association. And then also David Osterberg, uh, Professor Emeritus at the University of Iowa, founder of the Iowa Policy Project. He'll be joining us as well. Uh, and so now I'm gonna go ahead and jump into, uh, I'm gonna share my screen again, and then we're gonna jump to your introduction there, uh, Jeff. So I'm gonna go ahead and, Let's see here, go back to screen share. Um, Jeff, would you like to keep it on, oh, let's see here. Would you like to keep it on you or would you like me to share my screen? Oh, it, well, whatever Actually, you think, I, I'm, I'm ready to start talking. Uh, you can- Already. Whatever so, you think of. Yep. Okay, you want me to, you, you want me to proceed? Hello, Jeff, yep. Great. Uh, first of all, just thank uh, thank you all for being here and joining us this evening. Uh, it's uh, it's really a great privilege to be discussing 
such an important topic with, uh, with our citizenry. Sustainability is a fundamental component of building a strong community. Cedar Rapids has had a long history of sustainable practices and to city operations. Uh, Eric uh, Holthaus is our sustainability coordinator, part of our city team. And I'm very pleased that a number of years ago, we made the decision to create the position and then we recruited uh, Eric to the position and really has done uh, a phenomenal job raising uh, the importance of sustainability within our city organization and within our community. When Eric originally started, he actually began in the utilities department and we recognized uh, then the, important of, in the importance of the issues that Eric was working on as far as community-wide sustainability and organization-wide sustainability. And so we asked Eric to be part of the city manager's office, really reflecting that sort of global importance of his position. And uh, I think that was a good move. And, and as we've moved forward, uh, now talking about the climate plan, uh, it makes even more sense. Uh, the city's comprehensive plan is called Envision CR, and every strong community has a comprehensive plan. And that plan serves as a document uh, for all the work that we do within our city organization. The green CR, is one of the structural elements supporting the comprehensive plan. Uh, after intensive community outreach to build the plan, uh, the city council and the mayor heard from our residents that they wanted, we wanted to put sustainability at the center of the work of our community. The comprehensive plan itself calls for the creation of a municipal sustainability plan and our eye green CR action plan launched this year. Envision CR also calls for a community action plan to address challenges that come from our changing climate. It's uh, just very important that all of us are here today discussing this future plan and discussing how climate has changed uh, within our within our world, within our nation, within our state, and within our community. We've all been impacted in different ways. So I just think about the flood of, of 2008 and the impacts of that disaster. And then we think about 2016. We were able to protect the community at that time based on everything we'd learned from 2000 and eight, and we continue on those municipal protection efforts. And then just so very recently, the derecho, August 10th, 2020. And so we see uh, that there are changes in the climate and we are all important to finding solutions to these climate challenges uh, really before uh, it's, it's beyond our ability. So it's important for all of us and we're seeing it here locally. It has touched our community. This derecho, uh, I don't know how many saw the newspaper article talking about the magnitude, but this was one of the worst, if not the worst storm of its kind in the history of the United States. This was a big deal, it hit us hard, we're coming back strong, but there is no doubt that the climate is a force that all of us have to deal with, have to work with, and have to guide in a positive direction to avoid future such disasters. Recognizing the human contribution to these challenges and an increasing urgency for action, our city council and mayor in February passed a resolution urging climate action in the city of Cedar Rapids. So we're here now building a plan that responds to the city council's climate resolution. The resolution prompts significant greenhouse gas reductions for the city, implementing climate change adaptation strategies 
and focuses on meeting the needs of our most vulnerable residents. We're all in this together. Your input tonight is absolutely critical in the process. Again, we're thrilled that so many could join us tonight and we will continue together on this challenging work. Tonight, you'll learn more about the process and timeline for creating our community climate action plan, how to share your comments and thoughts on that plan, how to engage as a climate action leader in Cedar Rapids, and finally, how diverse perspectives are important to community climate change and creating a healthy, resilient, and equitable future for all Cedar Rapidians. I'm really proud uh, of the resolution that the council passed. I'm proud of Eric's work. I'm proud of our community planning efforts. And I'm really pleased, uh, even more pleased today, based on what happened on August 10th, uh, that we're moving together to address uh, this critical step to taking climate action in our great city of Cedar Rapids. So thank you again for being here. Thank you for participating and engaging. And I look forward to the evening. Thank you, Eric. Awesome, thank you so much, Jeff. Uh, it's been a privilege to work here for five years, uh, now in the city manager's office, uh, previously in utilities and uh, Steve Hirschner, who was integral in starting a lot of our staff efforts will be retiring here soon, but it was a privilege to work for him and be part of um, you know, a short period of his tenure. Uh, and now I'm gonna kind of take over and talk about our community climate action planning process so going forward. So certainly echoing a lot of what Jeff had said, we've been on a long trajectory um, and this really awesome convergence of community interests, council interests, city staff leadership. Uh, this has all come together at a really important time. Uh, community climate action might look obscure. It might look long-term. It might look like it's hard to grasp, but a few takeaways, if I could share some things that come to my mind when I think about community climate action, um, we'll be looking a bit more at this, but it is urgent. Um, it is about health, prosperity, community, helping people. Um, it's important to know, uh, this, uh, Mr. Rogers moment that you're special. You have something to contribute uh, in this effort in our community climate action plan. So think about that. What can you do? How can you lead by example in the things that you say um, and, and kind of what you do in your home or at work? Um, working on important stuff together feels good. I think a lot of you have probably experienced that, whether it be at work, at church, in the community, Coming together feels good, and this is one of those efforts. So imagine that future where we do work together uh, on community climate action. And so um, Cedar Rapids City Council passed this, and uh, Jeff went over this pretty well. Um, we have an urgency to take action as a community to address climate change, to do our part to address climate change. The reasons that this is important, um, this is some really basic stuff. Imagine that um, our earth is a cold beverage the greenhouse layer is a koozie. Our, uh, the sun brings in so much radiation, but if we didn't have that warm protective layer that is the greenhouse um, layer, the atmosphere, um, our earth would only be zero degrees. But because we have that warm protective layer that is comprised of greenhouse gases, it's about 60 degrees. And that greenhouse gas, uh, those, house, those greenhouse gases include carbon dioxide, nitrous dioxide, uh, methane, water vapor. Uh, and we've been pumping a lot of carbon dioxide into that, making it a thicker, more robust blanket around our earth. And so while um, a lot of radiation goes into the earth and then it bounces off and tries to escape back to space, we're holding more and more and more of that heat in. And that has really dramatic effects. And I just wanna say it's true that there are natural forcings that change the climate. Volcanoes can change the climate. Solar energy can change. Um, the Earth's axis is tilted and changes in the Earth's axis change the climate. Uh, but now people are contributing to climate change in a very significant way. And so this is from NASA, useful resource. This shows that the climate is changing. Uh, in some areas you can see here, it's a little bit cooler. In most areas, it's warmer. In some areas, it's a lot warmer. 
And so it's important to know that uh, when you think about climate change, you want to learn about it. What's going on outside is a small part of the bigger picture. Um, and when we look for information about climate science, we turn to the International Panel on Climate Change. We turn to the um, National Climate Assessment. We turn to the Iowa Policy Projects uh, publishings, publications on this. We turn to um, the annual Iowa Climate Statement that comes out each year. Um, and there's some really fantastic resources out there. Um, and in fact, I just watched uh, David Attenborough's uh, Life on Our Planet, and I would absolutely recommend that because it really reinstilled in me the urgency and the importance of this. Uh, we're at about 415 parts per million of carbon dioxide. It used to be a goal that we wanted to be down to 350. Uh, we have not seen 415 parts per million um, in all of the evolution of human beings that occurred in the last 300,000 years. It has not been this warm, or it has not, we have not seen that many parts per million of carbon dioxide since 2.5 to 5 million years ago in the Pleistocene. Uh, when the uh, Antarctica was a forest. And so there's been dramatic changes from carbon dioxide uh, entering our atmosphere that's changing the climate a lot across our globe, creating more intense weather more often. And so here, uh, our city council, our citizens, our city staff, recognizing the urgency for climate action, said we will uh, be part of these science-based targets. We will do our part as a community to address a global challenge to reduce carbon pollution, whether it be uh, coal, gas, um, oil, uh, we will reduce CO2 pollution uh, by 45% by 2030. Uh, we will achieve net zero by 2050. So any small amounts created, we will need to absorb, could be by planting trees, could be by soil sequestration, a variety of practices. We'll increase renewable energy to um, and nearly all of our energy will need to be renewable by 2050. Um, we will need to increase our resilience. Here in Iowa, we just saw the picture of the globe. Here in Iowa, we can anticipate having three times more days over 90 degrees than we do today. We can anticipate since 1960, we've had about a 40% increase in heavy rain events. Um, by 2060, we'll have 40% more. And the Cedar River is rising about one inch per decade. So those are all impacts of climate change. Those are some that are local that will impact us a lot. And as we have more extreme weather events more often, the derecho, other events, these will start to pile up and we need to figure out ways to become more resilient. And as we do these things, uh, we need to make sure that people's needs are met. Um, so ensuring access to clean water and clean air, good parks, tree-lined streets, uh, green jobs and green job training, um, these are all really important items that we need to address. And when we think about vulnerable residents, um, vulnerable residents are people that have existing barriers. It could be the case that they have language barriers. Uh, they might have low income or no income. Um, they could be from a different country and are not used to living here. Uh, they could be people of color. They could have, um, they might be really young. They might be really old. Those individuals are most impacted. Imagine an extreme event. Those people are most impacted by extreme events. If you don't have any money and it's really hot and you don't have air conditioning, you're really impacted. Um, if there's a disaster and you can't get a hotel in the next town over because you don't have that cash, um, you're really impacted by that. And so these are the types of things that we think about. And as we think about climate actions going forward that we're going to explore a bit, um, we need to make sure that everybody is part of our process, our learning process, and our prioritization process. Um, things like solar panels and electric vehicles will be an important important part of the solution, but there are other things that might be more accessible also to more people. Energy efficiency, planting trees to provide shade uh, and wind blocks in the winter. Uh, could be things like planting food, fruit trees, gardens, to make sure that people have access, people that need access are able to access healthy food. Um, biking, walking, busing, all really critical types of solutions in this. And as you can imagine, some of these are more accessible to more people and certainly people that have less uh, will be impacted and benefit a lot more by some of these types of investments. So when we think about equity, when we think about vulnerable residents, those are some examples that you can think of. And I love this graphic. Um, Amanda Rieger, our graphic design um, staff person made this. And I think it really excellently demonstrates, look on the left, 
here we have climate change causes and impacts. You can see that um, some of the causes are fossil fuels, um, sprawling development that makes us drive farther and emit more into the atmosphere, um, landfill waste emitting methane, uh, traffic emitting, um, and then some of the repercussions as we've talked about, worse air quality, higher heat events, flooding events. So when we think about solutions, we think about reducing greenhouse gases, think about energy efficient, uh, efficient buildings, think about multimodal and efficient transportation, rain gardens and native plants, waste reduction. Think about adaptation like planting trees, making room for the river, building communities where you can easily walk, bike and bus to the places you have to go. And so I think there's something in here for everybody. Uh, climate change is a big kind of existential daunting task or thing to address is hard to imagine. Think about the things that you already care about. Think about healthy food. Think about biking more safely. Think about wind turbines and being a wind turbine technician and these types of exciting jobs that are out there and will be growing uh, at extraordinary rates and already have. So there's something there for you. If climate change doesn't trip your trigger, think about other things that are part of this solution. And so in our planning process, uh, this is what it's gonna look like. So we have three months right now of education and community input, October to December. Tonight are our kickoff events. We're gonna be asking for your priorities, experiences, connections as a community member in the Community Climate Action Survey. Uh, that's at cityofcr.com slash sustainability. We'll be reminding you again in a bit. Uh, we will be having a climate advisory committee that will be uh, a public process. You apply, the mayor will eventually appoint you and that will be a nine month long type of appointment where you will be helping to lead and guide and give perspective to our long-term planning process. All of those things in the resolution we need to address. We need your perspective to tell us what is important and what we should focus on. Um, because we care about equity, and this is something that is, uh, I think, pretty innovative for us. Um, we knew that getting responses online on surveys works for some people. Coming to a kickoff event like this works for some people. It doesn't work for everybody. So through the help of neighborhood leaders in five of our more uh, vulnerable neighborhoods, um, we have developed relationships with uh, Monica as one of those individuals um, that has helped us reach communities that we have a harder time or don't connect with uh, as often as we should. So we've been working to build relationships and we will be going into neighborhoods to conduct surveys in, per uh, in person, uh, safe distancing, masks on. Uh, we'll be giving out um, things like uh, insulated tote bags, LED light bulbs, weatherization kits. We'll be signing people up for uh, energy audits with Green Iowa AmeriCorps. So we'll be giving something while we ask for people in these neighborhoods to give their input in that same survey on what is important to them. So that's part of our equity initiative in trying to create a very diverse and well-represented community climate action plan. Phase two, we'll see the planning work continue. We'll have the climate advisory committee uh, that will be helping us with long-term planning. Uh, we will be holding focus groups that will ask the business community, different areas of our community, what is important to you? Um, and continue in that ground team effort, those neighborhood relationships we formed with people like Monica, people like Mugisha that will be joining us in our next event, people like Green Iowa, people at Feed Iowa First. Um, we're gonna be doing while we're also planning. So the ground team members will sort of morph into this climate action neighborhood group that will begin taking actions like weatherizing homes, like planting fruit trees and gardens, like uh, helping to install more uh, safe bike infrastructure and uh, give bike lights out and bike locks, things like that. So while we're planning with the advisory committee, we will be doing with the Climate Action Neighborhood Group. And I think that's an innovative part in phase two that um, we've developed that I don't know that many other cities have done before. And then in phase three, you can see this community climate action plan coming to life. Uh, it will be reviewed by council. There will be a last opportunity for all community members to weigh in on the actions that we think are good ideas. We wanna know that they're good ideas to you too. Uh, we'll be seeking leaders in the community to identify yourself um, so that once we kick off this plan, we will have leaders ready to model 
climate action in the community. So after this long planning process, we're not exhausted. We're actually excited to hit the ground running and create these pockets of success and leadership to carry us forward. So that's what you can expect in the planning process for the next year. Um, the biggest things to keep in mind are that survey that we're going to want you to take. And you can also apply for the advisory committee spot starting tonight. These are open October 22nd to November 20th. And so I'm about to end my portion here. Uh, we'll have another virtual kickoff event on October 29th from 1030 a.m. till noon. Um, register beforehand so you can join us. If you cannot join us, it'll be recorded and it'll be posted on our website. And you can see the awesome diverse speakers perspectives we'll have at that event as well. Um, and again, from October 22nd, starting tonight till November 20th, roughly one month, you can take the Community Climate Action Survey and you can also apply for the Climate Advisory, Advisory Committee spot. Uh, and just think about how can you be a model for change in the way that you sort of carry yourself, the things that you ask questions about, whether it be at home, in the workplace, on committees that you're on, in your neighborhood, with your children, what can you do to start thinking about, talking about, making action in these many different ways that we can. Um, I think we can do really big things as a community. Uh, and so it's really excited to be joined by so many people tonight. And that'll be our segue into our awesome panelists that we have. So now we're gonna go ahead and switch to that. And we're gonna be, oh, hey, first we have an audience question. We looked at that diagram that showed all the different actions that we can take those were just some of the actions that we can take. Uh, we're curious now to hear from you as a poll question, what climate actions interest you the most? Um, kind of curious where to see people's heads are at. You can go ahead and I think uh, attendees are now viewing the questions. You have to take some time to think about these. There's a lot of options. So we're gonna start seeing the answers coming in now. When uh, multimodal and efficient transportation, you can imagine like electric vehicles, but you can also imagine busing, biking, walking, complete communities. That's a type of community where you are able to walk and bike to the grocery store, to work, to your different needs during the day. That's a complete community. Um, and I think many of the other things will make sense too. Forty-five out of 58 people have voted. We're roughly one minute in. We'll probably stop that here just in a moment. 48 out of 59 have responded and it looks like, uh, Sylvia, do you wanna go ahead and share that poll? 51. You're now viewing the poll results. Renewable energy. And I gave such a good pitch. Complete communities, followed by waste reduction, urban gardens, um, that is awesome to know. Awesome. Okay. Thank you very much for participating. It's our way to keep you engaged. Uh, now what we're going to do is move on to the next portion of our event and we're going to have our panelists speak for about five minutes each. And so we're going to move on next to, um, this is the order that, order that we'll go in. It'll be Carla Tweet Ball, followed by Mark Weldon, Monica Vallejo, and then Eric Tate. So uh, Carla, if you're ready to unmute yourself, we're gonna give you the stage and you can go ahead and tell me when you'd like me to transition the slide. So I'm gonna jump now to your first slide and take it away. Great, thanks. Um, and actually you can just go right to the second slide. Eric, thanks so much for, for launching this plan and um, your, your comments were great and exciting and you know, it's in my mind a worrying too. So I'm really glad to be here. So I'm Carla Tweetball. I'm with the Greater Cedar Rapids Community Foundation. And the, the first thing I'm going to start with is just because I get a lot of questions from people about what is a community foundation. I'm just going to start there for a moment. Um, a community foundation is a nonprofit organization. We work to build local philanthropy for the long-term benefit of communities. So our mission statement is on this slide, but we help donors give in meaningful ways. We strengthen nonprofits and we provide, provide leadership that support the vibrant community. So let me tell you why I think about climate action as it relates to my work at the Community Foundation. Um, when, when I think about vibrant community and when we talk about vibrant community at the Community Foundation, 
we're not just thinking about what makes this a great place to live right now or next year, but, but we're in this for the long haul. So we're thinking about 25, 50, 100 years from now. What, what makes this a really great place to live in, in 100 years? So as Eric just demonstrated from his, his slides and with the data he, he showed, if we don't address climate challenges now, we're, we're not going to experience that vibrant community in, in 50 years. So um, and you can advance slide the slide, Eric. So I'd like to share some of the ways that the Community Foundation is thinking about and can be a partner in climate mitigation, adaptation, and resiliency efforts. So what, what are some of the actions we take? Some of them relate to climate. Some of them, um, you know, not all our work relates to climate, but it gives us sort of the opening and the opportunity um, to, to continue thinking forward and building this in as we, as we go on. So I, the, the first way is through our community partnerships and our community leadership priorities. So one of those community leadership priorities is disaster response, recovery, and resiliency. So um, this dates back to the 2008 flood um, where we sort of all as a community launched into work that none of us really were expecting to launch into. But certainly over the last 12 years from the Community Foundation stand, standpoint, um, we've put lots of time into thinking about what are the partnerships, um, who, who are we participating with, how are we approaching um, disaster response, but really looking forward to some of the resiliency efforts. And, and then, you know, the logical next step is definitely thinking about mitigation and how we avoid this kind of, of situation in the future. So um, over the past 12 years, we've spent somewhere around $20 million on disaster response. And those dollars are a direct result of climate change. So it definitely builds a case for us for why this matters. Um, you know, flooding, pandemic, derecho. Um, the other thing that I think about in terms of community leadership priority, um, I, I think back to Eric's words when, when Eric, you talked about, it's about health, prosperity, community, helping people. So that's really strong alignment with how we think about building healthy communities. So where people have what they need to thrive economically, socially, and in other ways. So this includes particular investment of time and resources with communities that have been marginalized and made vulnerable. Um, and, and as you talked about, they have much to lose through um, climate changes and much to gain through, through the action plan that you're talking about, with your, especially with the way that you're paying particular attention to the kinds of needs that they have. So that's, that's the first one, the community partnerships and priorities. Um, the second way that we can think about taking action is through the grants that we make. So we are a funder. Um, that's a, a key role that we play in the community. We make grants to nonprofit organizations. And last year we granted $11 million. So obviously these are not all climate grants and we do grants all across the country, but well over half the grants that we make stay in our community. So they, they're contributing to that vibrant community I mentioned and certainly give us a chance to um, be supportive of, of climate change, the climate plan efforts. Um, the third way on here that I mentioned is through donor relationships. So. We work with donors. That's another part of being a community foundation. So we help donors take action on issues that they care about. So we have donors whose ph philanthropy targets environmental and social goals that align with this plan. And so we're really happy to partner with them. And the last one is probably the newest way that we think about taking action in this and it's through our investment policy. So um, as a community foundation, we have a lot of endowed funds where we have our funds invested for the long term. And our newest investment pool from the long-term investment options is the uh, ESG pool, which is, it stands for Environmental, Social, and Governance Pool. And that's really for fund holders that want to think about helping to reduce um, risk, um, think about enhancing enterprise value and, and being more of a general benefit to society. So we, we look for funds that help us forward those um, goals. So... Uh, I'm, I'm really excited about the launch of the city plan and I'm looking forward as um, an individual and as a community foundation staff person to finding ways to rise to the occasion that you, you sort of set forth and finding new ways to enhance and support climate action in my work. So thank you, Eric. Awesome. It's great to have you as a partner, Carla. Thanks for taking the time tonight. And uh, there's always more to learn about the Cedar Rapids uh, Community Foundation. So you guys do awesome work and you support so many great causes. So it's really great to get connected um, 
to figure out how some of these resources can be, can keep going to uh, some of this really awesome work that we're going to keep doing. So thank you very much, Carla. Um, next, we're going to move on to uh, Carla's card. Next, we're going to move on to Mark Weldon. Mark Weldon from PepsiCo and Quaker Oats. Would you like to take it over, Mark? Sure, if you'd advance the slide. And uh, thanks, everybody, for the opportunity. I've just got a couple slides to share with you. And, and most of the time, it's just going to be me talking about this particular slide. But both of these slides come from PepsiCo's sustainability report that was uh, issued about a year ago. And so um, you can uh, simply search the internet for PepsiCo sustainability report. You can uh, get this document and, and several others if you're interested in the details. But I thought this was a good summary document to, to show what PepsiCo's priorities were in terms of sustainability. So <clears throat> I'm not sure if you can read them easily or not, but I'll read them very quickly. The six are next generation agriculture, improved choices across our portfolio, positive water impact, climate change mitigation, circular future for packaging, and people and prosperity. And um, in, in my role, I focus on two of these primarily, and that's the positive water impact and the climate change mitigation. But there are literally hundreds of people within the PepsiCo organization that are involved in these goals in one way or another. <clears throat> what I thought I'd do is, is um, uh, try to better define what at least these two mean that I, that I work with. So for positive water impact, um, what it means that in high water risk areas by, 2020, by 2025, we intend to improve water use efficiency by 15% in our supply chain, which is mainly focused on corn and potatoes. We also intend to improve our operational water use efficiency by 25%. That means the water use in, in our own plants and our own distribution centers. Um, we intend to replenish 100% of the water we consume in manufacturing operations and deliver safe water access to 25 million people by 2025. And again, this is in, in the what we call high water risk areas. So this doesn't necessarily apply to all of our operations, but any of our operations um, across the world where water availability is an issue. Um, the other area that I work in is in climate change mitigation. And our goals here are to reduce our absolute greenhouse gas emissions across our value chain. That means us and all of our suppliers and distributors and things by 20% by the year 2030. <clears throat> so that includes our manufacturing plants, um, which are called scope one and two greenhouse gas emissions. If you're not familiar with the terminology, Scope one generally refers, at least for us, to the natural gas that we burn and use within our own plants. And scope two refers to electricity that we purchase uh, from the grid. And so there's greenhouse gases associated with its creation uh, by electric utilities. And then also uh, for our suppliers, um, in terms of agriculture, packaging, and transportation, which we call a scope three emission. And um, when I first learned this, it was a little surprising, but if you were to, to think about where most of our greenhouse gases uh, emitted, they're not from our plants and our own facilities, but they're from our value chain. And uh, we estimate that about 92% of the greenhouse gas emissions actually come from our value chain and 8% come from within our, within our own plants. So those are the, the two PepsiCo goals that really I'm uh, focused on helping us achieve. And <clears throat> to give you a few details just about, well, how do we do that? You know, how do we approach that? What do we do? Um, we work uh, basically from, from in two approaches. We look for uh, energy efficiency projects, right, where we can invest uh, capital dollars and put in uh, new equipment, new control systems, things like that, that make our processes more efficient. We can also look at, at what we call behavioral opportunities where we look at how we run our own plants and either by um, the help of our operators or rescheduling or different things like that, can we use the equipment that we have and operate it in a more efficient way? And so those are the two main approaches that we take. Um, but we also um, are very diligent about um, having goals and striving to meet those goals. So 
I just told you a little bit about our Pensacola's long-term goals. One was a, basically a 10-year goal, one was a 15-year goal. But we have goals every year for our plants uh, to improve. Um, and so that, you know, trying to get better uh, every year by one or 2% or 3% over 10 years adds up to a fairly large number. And within those annual goals, um, we do, we pay a lot of attention to them and we monitor and report on them regularly. So every four weeks, we will report within our plants in terms of how we're doing against our energy efficiency, our water efficiency, our waste reduction efforts, those kind of things. And then we share those results with plant personnel and with division leadership. So every four weeks, I have an audience with the Quaker leadership team and I get to report to them on how each of our plants is performing against our goals for, for this year. And then um, finally, and, and uh, Eric, if you advance to the, to the last slide, I'm not gonna talk much about it, but again, this is available on the internet and, and, and it's important for us to share our results. So you can go look at the PepsiCo sustainability report and you can see you know, what progress have we made on all those six areas. That's it for me, Eric, thank you. I just took a picture of that last slide because I liked it a lot and I maybe we'll try to use something like that for some of <laughs> our reporting, but thanks a lot, Mark, for sharing. I've uh, known you for a long time and it's been, um, it's, it's great to keep that connection um, and you're doing impressive work and uh, being part of a lot of really good change in a really big complex organization. So thanks for sharing your side of sort of the commercial and the industry side, kind of a big, big global partner. So yeah. my thanks pleasure for, for having me. Awesome, thanks, Mark. Uh, now we're gonna move on to a lady who is connected in so many ways in our community, from the Young Parents Network to the West Hill Neighborhood Association to the League of United Latin American Citizens. We have Monica Vallejo joining us tonight. And so Monica, you can go ahead and take it from here. Thank you, Eric, thank you. Um, this exciting for me to see how the future is going to planning. Thank you to the city. Thank you for the opportunity to give us. The Neighborhood Association, my work actually is the Hispanic Program Specialist in Young Parents Network, YPM. Give me the opportunity to know, to be connected with the Latino community and be part to different programs in the city. This is what I, I was part of the Western Neighborhood Association and be excited to be collaborate with uh, African neighbors, with um, uh, American neighbors, we can say, and with Latinos, because the population is a lot in the Western area neighborhood. So, the opportunity for me, and we work with the Western neighborhood before to trying to have the families to open and doing the green areas like the vegetable areas. We founding the seeds for uh, families to grow their own vegetable area. That was a wonderful idea for people in the neighborhood association and there was um, in the future to do more the kind of stuff in the area. To the vegetables that they can have a lot of, to the families and to the city and to the neighborhood. The plans that we have and we are talking about the climate change for months, they change to the areas and give the opportunity to families that live in the areas and to the city to some kind of recreation for the neighbors, like put, we have recently to put the soccer court in the park, we have the basketball uh, people so they can come and play. So this is a something that we move, we have to move a little bit more far for more uh, green areas, more entertaining areas. And so they can, people can, go and walk and do some kind of sport of side, especially in this time, the year with COVID and with the ratio with a lot of families be in the apartments or in the house and don't have the opportunity to have, uh, to go outside and do some kind of exercise. 
So this is important for me and for the area. And what I, uh, I'm Latino, I live in this country for 30 years, or a little bit more maybe, but what I, we want to, uh, to do is to be partner with the city, with the people who can help, like I say before, please let us help to be part of the community. Let us help to be the bridge to engage the community with the city, with the neighborhood. We want to learn, only teach us how to do it. We want to do the, um, the recycle uh, area for the, uh, for the neighborhood. The only we need is education. I think education is so important for both sides, not only for the neighborhood, but for the city too, to learn how the neighbor needs in the area. So to be part of this program, I think it's wonderful. They can help in the future for uh, everybody. They can be more healthy life and looks up very, very future for, for that. I can say for my grandkids or for the kids and coming in the future. We, the Rachel, we was very hard in the area. That was very broken hard to see how many families get destroyed up the mobile homes, the apartments, but we get together by community and we help everywhere for everywhere they come they help. And it was wonderful to see how we work together to trying to help everybody. We don't just think what color the skin you are, we help everybody. And this is it's hard, it's hard to see how many families they don't have economical to, uh, to start um, reconstruct the mobile homes or start one more time from zero from the, because they lost the apartment. So with this kind of plan to start together is the more important and whatever we need to do, I'm be happy to do it. And I think for them, the three organizations that I belong, we are very happy to be part of this program. Awesome, thank you, Monica. Uh, it's been great to get to know you and hear your words. Um, I got to know you at our uh, Neighborhood Resource Center after the derecho and you provided so many useful connections. You provided so much help. You provided so much organization to our site. Uh, and so it's been great getting to know you and uh, I'm really excited to keep engaging with you and everybody that you're connected with. It was my pleasure, it was my pleasure. Okay, thank you very much, Monica. Now we're gonna move on to our fourth panelist of four. And then after that, we're gonna jump into a Q&A session with our panelist. So here, uh, coming up next, uh, Dr. Eric Tate uh, from the University of Iowa. Um, Eric, would you like to take it from here? I can go yeah, to your- Yeah, sure. Program. Great, thank you. Uh, you can move ahead. I'm gonna talk about um, the equity um, uh, with related to climate action planning. Um, and this is good timing. We're just coming off the release of the 2020 Iowa Climate Statement. Um, this was a statement um, put out by climate researchers and teachers in the, universe, in, in the, in the state of Iowa across 30 different, 37 different universities, 230 signatories, um, essentially putting forth three main points that um, number one, science is the best guide for public health and climate crises. There's a lot of debate on uh, legitimate debate on what to do about climate change, um, but there is um, very little dissension among the science community about the causes of, of climate change being, um, you know, human uh, increases in, in, in greenhouse gas emissions and leading to lots of unpredictability in um, climate effects. Second is that better preparation can save lives and money. Um, this is essentially, um, you know, the old adage, a pound of uh, an ounce of prevention can be worth a pound of cure. Uh, we spend a lot of time, you know, in effort and resources in the aftermath of climate um, disasters. And, you know, planning processes like that Cedar Rapids is embarking on uh, is, is a good approach. Third, uh, Eric mentioned this in his intro, that vulnerable populations need additional support. I'm gonna add on this to that, uh, also should be included in the decision-making processes. 
Um, and the fourth is that the government, you know, efforts can be, um, you know, added investments to, you know, think about adapting to climate change in a more resilient way. Um, thank you. Next slide, please. So um, there are lots of climate impacts from heat to um, drought, severe storms. Uh, I'm going to focus on floods because that's what I know the most. And um, I would say sort of the dominant approach that we think about floods and dealing with them are thinking about the physical elements of floods. How is the water flow? Um, what's its frequency, its return period, all this kind of thing. And then investing in like um, improved management techniques during the flood, before the flood, disaster recovery and assistance. I know disaster assistance has been all in the news uh, with respect to the derecho. Um, but I would also say that there's a third element uh, just as crucial to um, understanding disaster impacts and that's social characteristics um, in that, you know, the impacts of, of climate hazards and disasters don't, um, don't tend to occur equally across populations. Next slide, please. So although there are these, you know, these varied dimensions, um, we don't, generally take into full account the social aspects and social characteristics. And so there's lots of great techniques, for example, for dealing with floods, um, approaches including zoning and um, building levees and flood, flood proofing and flood insurance. But traditionally, these haven't really taken into account differences across the population. And so these are expenditures, these are investments, these are priorities, and, you know, with this planning process coming from the start, it's an opportunity um, to, to make sure that um, the benefits accrue to all. Next slide, please. So I'm also part of the Climate Action Commission with the city of Iowa City. And we've been working on this for a couple of years. And um, what I'm showing you on this slide is a few of the top five sort of categories of priorities that the Iowa City planning process has, has, has come up with. Focus on buildings um, and um, so building efficiency, for example, uh, transportation, waste, um, um, adaptation, green jobs, for example, and sustainable lifestyles. And strategies like this are really crucial to reduce carbon emissions, which is, should certainly be a major focus of any planning process. Um, but also to remember that these are investments and so um, they're dollars. And um, will, how will these be spent? How will these um, benefit people across the community? Are there certain places that will benefit more than others? Who gets to participate in these planning processes? Um, so I would say, um, uh, it was great. I heard about the, you know, the ground teams. This is a really great start, I think. Um, but I also encourage the city to think about who is participating on the climate advisory board and making sure that that's reflective of the entire community. Um, because this is a, it's a unique opportunity, climate adaptation to move things forward for everybody. Um, but, you know, equity is going to be integral, need to be integral for that to occur. Next slide, please. Um, and so I think there's a couple ways of thinking about this equity, about allocating resources, certainly equal protection so that everybody benefits, but it's also about satisfying basic human needs that may be unmet. Um, so, um, you know, um, the second thing is sort of meaningful in community involvement. And I stress the word meaningful there. Um, and maybe, it, you know, throwing a couple ways to maybe think about in integrating equity into the process in addition to sort of the participation. What I'm showing here is um, there's, a, there's a graphic here from the National Flood Insurance Program. They did a study that found that um, a lot of people weren't buying flood insurance just because they couldn't afford it. So this is an example of a major program that helps people withstand adverse impacts, but yet it's not really accessible to everybody. Um, Harris County, Texas, where the city of Houston is located, has um, looking at how they should be prioritizing 
their flood mitigation investments. And one of the things they added in here was an assessment of social vulnerability that they weighted 20% in their decision making process. So this is actually in, you know, integrated into their decision making processes. Um, at a more local scale, one of the things we've been experimenting with in Iowa City is mapping social characteristics across the community and then seeing where the investments go that are proposed by the climate planning process, and then use that to see how equitable these, uh, these investments are. So, um, you know, I, I really like what I'm seeing so far in the, you know, getting off the ground for the Cedar Rapids um, planning process, um, but I just wanted to, um, to weigh in with just an additional emphasis of making equity integral into the process. Thank you. See here. Awesome. Thank you, Eric. Uh, that was a really great review. I've, um, I used to be a student at the University of Iowa, studied geography. That's where Eric Tate's located too. And I graduated before he was there. And then I had a bunch of friends that took him as a professor or in his classes and always talked about how great he was. So it's awesome now to be joining you uh, tonight and to have you here and uh, hear some of your lessons and perspectives. So thanks for joining us, Eric. We're now going to move on to the uh, Q&A with the panelists and just a brief reminder here on what we're doing and how to do it. Uh, I'm going to turn off my screen share here in just a moment so we can see all each other's faces all big on the screen. So you can type questions now into the Q&A box. Um, if you would not like to ask a question because either you don't have easy access to a keyboard um, or you would just like to not use that option, um, you can raise your hand and Sylvia behind the scenes is going to find you and um, your mic can be turned on. We'll call your name and you can ask your question. We would just ask that you be brief um, so that we can get to as many participants as possible. Uh, and then if questions are unanswered, those that are typed, but we don't get to them, uh, we'll provide answers at cityofcr.com slash sustainability. And a reminder that this is being recorded and so if you'd like to go back and visit anything we've discussed so far or answers provided, you'll have the opportunity to do that. So uh, this is my first time in doing one of these and it's not Sylvia's first and that's why she's here. So I'm gonna stop my screen share and we're gonna go back here. And we have, uh, it looks like so far, we have one question um, and the question is, um, many personal choices we can make are dictated by the options provided to us by businesses. So how does the city plan to engage with businesses so they provide us with the options that we want? Maybe that's uh, directed toward me, but Mark, you work for a big business. Can I go ahead and uh, start with you and see what you might have to say in this regard, how customers impact your business? Yeah, I, I'm certainly not a marketer. So this is a little bit of a stretch for me, but I think it, the essence of the question is very valid, right? In that uh, we and most companies make a limited number of products. And we, um, I don't, in, in our case, we try to make some healthy products, um, but there are other products that are not so healthy, but they sell very well. And so you have this kind of continuum, but um, certainly that was is one of PepsiCo's uh, goals um, is uh, improved choices across our portfolio, right? So we're trying to at least uh, offer as many healthy choices uh, as we can. Thanks for that, Mark. I'm just going to respond briefly. I'm going to see if other panelists might like to as well. Um, it's okay if you if if, if you don't want to, panelists. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and say that we will likely have um, focus groups and um, those focus groups will likely include businesses of different sizes. I've also seen communities that particularly engage uh, what would be called anchor institutions. Those anchor institutions could be, could be the community foundation, it could be uh, schools, it could be hospitals, it could be colleges big organizations that are very rooted in the community that also pull a lot of resources and make big impacts. Sometimes they can work together to figure out ways that we can source local solutions and really, really move the needle when they work together. So um, anchor institutions is an idea. 
um, working through focus groups with the business community uh, is something that we would intend to do. Um, so that's, that's kind of what we're thinking as we go forward in the January through September planning and engagement process. Um, uh, would any others want to take a quick stab at it? Um, if not, that's okay. All righty, we're going to go ahead and move on. So thank you for that question. Um, we had uh, someone that raised their hand, uh, and I think that we're going to go to that person next. So this will be a new opportunity to have uh, the mic turned on of who is it going to be, Sylvia? Can you can you help us with this portion? Her, her name is Emily Stokel. So Emily, I am enabling your mic now, so you should be able to ask your question. All right. Thanks, Emily. Hi there. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Okay. yeah, I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit more about the role of the Climate Advisory Committee and what kind of input they'll be having for the, com uh, the community's climate action plan. What more you envision them doing? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I'll go ahead and take that one. Um, and the Advisory Committee is going to be, um, those are going to be public meetings. Uh, other people could attend if they want to, but We'll have 11 to 15 members on the Climate Advisory Committee. You can apply now. Um, on the climate resolution, it was stated that we should do our best to get representation, and Eric had mentioned this too, from uh, quite the diversity of residents in our community. So one, you can anticipate that we'll have diverse perspectives on that advisory committee. Uh, we're looking right now, we put out a request for proposals to have a consultant help us guide this process. Um, and so we're going to be having a planning process um, that includes, you know, first kind of starting with values, vision, what are our principles, moving on to, you know, uh, can the advisory committee help us define those? Can the advisory committee help us identify who we should be connecting with in the community for focus groups, in the business community, anchor institutions, neighborhood associations, other types of focus groups we might have? So the advisory committee would be helpful with that providing connections, perspective, even if you don't have a lot of connections, just questions and ideas. Um, and then by the end, we're gonna be identifying sort of what our strategies are. We're gonna be going through kind of evaluation matrices to say, how do these actions that we can take impact equity? How much do they impact greenhouse gases? How much do they perhaps um, you know, generate jobs, uh, green jobs. There's a lot of different variables that we'll be evaluating that an advisory committee member will help us evaluate. Um, and then we'll be going out and asking the community for feedback on these different actions that we choose. And the advisory committee will be helping to promote, um, perhaps helping in neighborhoods do some of the in-person surveying. So there's kind of a whole range of opportunities to provide perspective, ask good questions, say the things that you care about no matter who you are in the community. Uh, and so again, that'll be 11 to 15 people that we'll have. And you can go ahead and apply um, at cityofcr.com slash sustainability. Thanks for asking your so question. Eric it, looks like, Eric, it looks like we have a couple other hands raised. Um, so if you're wrapped up with that one, um, I'm going to go ahead and call on the next person. We have Robin Cash. Um, Robin, I am turning your mic on now. Okay. Robin, it looks like you might be muted. How's that? We can hear you. Heather, I can hear you. Okay, now. great. Okay, I uh, need to learn to read. Uh, in any event, it seems to me that in uh, terms of uh, addressing climate uh, change issues that businesses and, and big institutions will certainly be heard. I wonder how, uh, you know, working people and kind of, uh, for lack of a better phrase, ordinary citizens will be heard and how their concerns will be weighed uh, in, uh, in formulating a way forward. Yeah. It, Robin, I appreciate that question. I, I got to talk a lot in the last part. I have a bit to say in response to that, but I do want to turn it over to uh, Eric. I know that you were involved in the advisory committee um, for Iowa City. Would you be able to reflect on any experiences about how you might have connected with working people, people in neighborhoods? Yeah, I would say that that's something that we 
we didn't do as well. Um, that, you know, this is something, an effort we've been trying to make more and more going forward. Um, that, you know, if the, the, to whatever ex the greatest extent you can have a, both a top down and a bottom up approach where, you know, residents are being, you know, heard from from the very start and can have influence in processes. Um, I think that's going to get lead to a more representative and more sort of widely accepted um, set of outcomes and pathways. Um, so we've had, we've included some surveys. We have, um, our commission has several um, outreach, uh, sorry, working groups. Um, and so they'll have a few commission members, but then also some members from the community uh, that's actually getting into details on some of the work. And so um, community members are, can be part of the working group and part of the surveys. We've had several public events um, where we can, you know, share our progress, collect feedback, um, and we had an intern um, for a summer and her, she was focused really on sort of getting a better understanding of the organizations within the community that represent different um, groups of people. And, you know, uh, tr now we're trying to integrate that into certain, in terms of which, which other groups do we need to bring into the decision-making processes to best help represent um, the community. Um. Hey, Robin, I'm going to provide just a little bit more. Um, so when we started our sort of preparation for the planning process, uh, we knew that we were going to have these kickoff events. And this is a little bit conventional. Um, but we also knew that we wanted to uh, really diversify participation. So we did a lot of research. Um, we reached out. We connected with the United Way's report on social equity in our community. What neighborhoods have the greatest, say, equity or vulnerable residents in their neighborhoods. And so that's what made us form kind of this ground team approach. Um, so uh, very early on, we were connecting with them, at least through the surveying effort. Um, but then the two things going forward, the Climate Advisory Committee, um, I think because we want to, but then also it's written into the resolution, we, we do kind of have a mandate to really diversify that committee uh, to meet some of the types of needs that you're describing, or not, not needs, but just uh, perspective, that broad perspective that includes um, not just industry, but people that work, people that work, um, people that are residents, neighborhoods, uh, in their neighborhoods, um, young people, uh, people that have perhaps food security or uh, issues or other types of vulnerabilities. So that's kind of baked into the process uh, for the Climate Advisory Committee. I think as we do outreach to focus groups, we have opportunities there. And as I had mentioned, kind of like the ground team effort so Monica has been great in helping build connections with all those different networks that she has. We're going to continue that work while the advisory committee is meeting to kind of keep action going in neighborhoods to start building engagement relationships and communications. And so that's going to be kind of like the planning will have kind of the diversity packed into it. And then we'll also be taking action simultaneously. Um, and then we'll kind of in the long term planning process we'll have kind of different things that are different variables that we'll have to weigh and evaluate for what actions we wanna take as a community. And if it so happens that energy efficiency crosses more boxes like equity, low cost, high impact, than other types of actions, um, we'll have the opportunity to choose those. Um, so those are some ways kind of in the beginning, in the surveying, in the long-term, in the short-term action throughout the process uh, I've just actually learned that, you know, connecting with Monica, connecting with others, we've, we've worked to kind of build these relationships to the best of our ability. And, and it's going to need, we're going to need to keep doing it. It's not something that you do want to say, uh, thanks. Um, it's going to be something that we need to pay attention to. So we'll need you to keep asking that question as time goes on. Um, would anyone else like to contribute to uh, a response to Robin's question? All right, thanks everyone. So what is the, um, Sylvie, we have some questions in the Q&A box. And the thing about those is that I know that some of you have already typed it. We have an opportunity to um, capture those and response to those. We've thought already kind of a bit about if you have the opportunity to raise a hand and ask a question, you're not typing things. So we can't respond to those later on on the website. So we kind of talked about prior prioritizing people that raise their hands. Um, Sylvie, would you like to go to someone next that has their hand raised then? Is that a good idea? Yep, so we have two hands raised. Um, 
And yeah, thanks for the reminder that we'll be able to answer those typed questions after the meeting. I don't want people who put their questions in the Q&A box to feel like they're being ignored. Um, the next person we have up is Mackenzie Macho. So Mackenzie, I am enabling your mic now. Hi, um, I was just wondering, how are you going to measure climate resiliency over the long term? Uh, great question. Um, I mean, very briefly, there are some tools that we can say, these are the expected climate hazards in Iowa and Cedar Rapids, high heat events, flash flooding events, major river flooding events. Um, and then what types of actions can we take that um, can say mitigate high heat events for people that have less protection from the heat. So it might be something like, are, is shade available? Is air conditioning accessible for people that currently don't have access to it? So you can kind of measure things like who has air conditioning, who doesn't. Um, I know those things get a little bit challenging, but those are some general ways you start with the hazards and then you start doing kind of an assessment over all the different social aspects and you start choosing ways to move forward and measuring improvements. I think Eric Tate might be able to respond to that as well. I know my response was a little bit vague, but um, Eric, would you be able to contribute any more details or perspective? Uh, sure, I, you know, I think in a broad concept like resilience, making it actionable really helps to break it down into smaller pieces. And so a lot of these initiatives focus on, you know, there's natural components to resilience, there's social, there's human skills, workforce development, for example. And so by breaking these down into to, to pieces, then you can develop indicators that you want to, to measure and track your progress to see if you're improving uh, over time. And you know whatever dimensions and whatever indicators you might choose is gonna be dependent on sort of the priorities of the community. Okay, thank you. Um, thanks for that question, Mackenzie. And I was just going to say, if, uh, so the consultant that we're going to hire, it, those questions do get a little bit technical as well, in addition to kind of the, the non-technical side of it. But a really good resource to check out if you have time is resilience.toolkit.gov. If you just search resilience toolkit government, you'll find kind of a, a fantastic resource from NOAA. Um, and um, will likely be following some types of best practices that are kind of laid out there. So, hey, uh, Sylvia, I wouldn't mind going to one of the first questions that popped up in the Q&A. Um, it's about coordinating with surrounding cities like Marion, Robbins, and Hiawatha. Um, and I just wanted to point out that since the Lynn County Sustainability Manager has been hired, we've uh, you know, developed a standing meeting with her to find out priorities from the county. We've got a like a, a likely solar project going on next year where we're working together on another solar group by. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that I think a, an opportunity like ha having a focus group of what regional partners can do is an opportunity. Um, so I think that we haven't put a lot of details, I think, into that, but we do have some good relationships, I think, with the county and some really good places in the planning process, like in focus groups to um, discuss with other cities on how some of the programs and best practices that we are developing can um, help to inform or learn from practices in other communities so that if we develop say an awesome climate action neighborhood program, how could we scale it not only to other neighborhoods in Cedar Rapids, but perhaps drum up support for things like that in other communities in our region too. So we don't have all those details figured out, but uh, there's, there's certainly intention and opportunities to, to coordinate. Um, Sylvia, would you like to find the next person that has a raised hand? Or actually, hey, let me turn that, um, Carla, uh, would you have any, um, or anybody else, would you have any other ideas for how we might connect with other communities? And that might be programs or relationships that already exist with other communities that we can be mindful of? Yeah, I mean, I was, I was mulling that over as you talked. Um, Eric and I, and then also with the county as well, um, have had some conversations. There's a, a, a grant program called Partners for Places that um, requires a partnership between a community foundation and a um, uh, city or municipality that's a member of the Urban Sustainabilities Directors Network, which 
both Eric and the county are, are mem the city and the county are both members of that. So had some conversation about that. I, that's a, an interesting grant program in that um, in terms of the, the equity issues, that's that's a requirement baked into the grant. I mean, you can't apply for something that's not really solely, you know, and very targeted in their focus on that. So, I mean, that's one thing that I, I hope we're able to take advantage of that going forward, that that's something that um, we can apply to and that, that crosses jurisdictional boundaries. Um, it would be, you know, sort of an ideal. One of the, you know, the Community Foundation, our, our footprint is Lynn County. So doing things that extend beyond just Cedar Rapids and are able to integrate, um, the, the whole metro area and the countywide area as well would be something that's important in, in terms of specific projects. We don't, we don't have anything going on right now for that other than, you know, the, the disaster part of it clearly is um, region wide, but I, I would love to see more work happen in that way. Thanks, Carla. Hey, Monica, with the uh, YPN, with LULAC, do you envision, uh, you know, do you have connections with programs and other communities that might be interesting to explore? Um, for this time, we don't have too many programs because the COVID, but before, or maybe we planning something, but it's so difficult to do different programs with the community because the COVID. We have a drunk country for the western area in, in two weeks, I think, or I think less. But I, this is something they, we have to be so careful and not too many people. There's a lot of restrictions for we uh, involved, but of course, when summertime or spring, it can be opening for a lot of programs. But for right now, I'm sorry, we is be part to the meetings that we have every month. And there's a, we discuss not only programs, but discussing different uh, problems that we have in the neighborhood. So welcome to come. We have the Facebook, one at Facebook, when we put the Zoom meetings because everything is by Zoom and we can part to the meetings too. And actually we have, uh, because the Neighborhood Association is um, the Western area is very diversity have a lot of diversity over there. So we have a practice one uh, invite everybody, but uh, if they need translation, they can be in English or in French or in Guajili, we do that. Awesome. Okay, thanks for that, Monica. Hey, that reminded me of something I wanted to get to quick and then we'll jump to the next person with their hand raised, but our survey online is available in I think five total languages. Um, so uh, that's useful to reach out to a larger uh, spectrum of our community. Um, I also wanted to mention that the school district with Liz Callahan and at Cedar River Academy um, helped to translate the survey, uh, but translate it for kids that are in K through sixth grade so that they can better understand it and contribute. And then we also got the survey out to each of the two colleges and Kirkwood Community College uh, in our community to try to drive up, uh, again, youth and um, college voices in this um, and, and yeah and this is very important to do the information and the language they need because sometimes if they don't have a very good translation it's difficult to understand so thank you to to do the translation in the way that people understand in this process they have to be with the language that people understand yeah, thanks for that. You were a good instigator of that. So thanks, Monica. I was just going to quickly point if you, um, Mayor Hart had asked, how do we find out about what steps the city has already taken? If you go to cityofcr.com slash sustainability, you can see our 2018 report that was very comprehensively stating all of our sort of sustainability metrics and achievements to date. It's a really comprehensive list that has a report, our four star sustainability report. Our iGreen CR action plan that you can find at the website is our municipal sustainability plan, which shows sort of where we've been and what we'll plan to do going forward. And you can find a variety of tools and resources that help to describe sustainability efforts to date. Um, there was a hand up. Should we jump to that one, Sylvia? Yeah, um, it's Leland Fry. So Leland, I'm turning your microphone on now. It looks like you're on mute.
Yeah, I was just kind of a follow up, I guess, uh, with Monica about, you know, it's kind of a continuing challenge to how we reach out as a community to the Latino population. And uh, I don't know if you have any other ideas or what normal citizens like myself can do to bridge uh, those gaps in understanding. But it sounds like you've made some positive steps already too, Eric. So that's all. Oh, thank you. Yeah, any, any thank additional you. responses? Uh, I think, yeah, the Latino communities around the, the whole city, but we try to work everywhere. With the Lula, I try to, in YPN, we serve in Latino community and young mothers, young families, and uh, it's around Zero Rapids, so it's not only West Dallas, everywhere with the Latino community. And the Latino community, we're trying to do different programs, but the COVID is so difficult. Uh, we had a festival Latino that we need to cancel this year, but next year we're going to do bigger than the was before. So yeah, for right now, people is in the house and they don't want to do too much. And I understand, but when we need, the one, the only I can see the change and the effort for the community, everybody the, in the community, what the um, derecho on the storm, I can see so many faces, uh, the different color, we get together, we work together, and this is the best. Even though it was so hard the time, I think was the, the partnership that we did with everybody was the best, I can say. This is the Rachel led me, the best partnership I made in the Rachel to serve in the community. And th that's only I can say about the Latinos. As soon as we have something more safe, I think we're going to start more programs. In YPM, they always had opportunity to volunteer people to do different part to volunteer with the, the community. So if they want to do something, be involved with YPM. Thanks for that, Monica. Thank hey, uh, I know that we're just about time, but this question had been lingering for a while and it was a pretty high interest, I know, in the survey. I'm gonna see if we might be able to ask this if people can leave if they have to, of course. You've always been able to do that. But this last question uh, for Eric Tate uh, it says, could you talk a little bit about the role of community gardens or food infrastructure and the role it has in supporting climate action and those with high social vulnerabilities? Uh, sorry, community gardens and what was the second one? Community gardens and food infrastructure and how it can be related to climate action and supporting those with social vulnerabilities. Okay, well, um, by community gardens, I'm guessing like rain gardens, is that what, or we're talking about rain yeah. gardens, community gardens for food. Urban gardens, I think, yeah. Uh, urban gardens for food, okay. Um, well, certainly, you know, there's challenges with food security and, um, you know, you know, complete diets. And it, you know, th there can be challenges to get to places where there is both an availability of, 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 of healthy food and, um, and people have access financial resources to that. So community gardens, you know, so some people talk about food deserts within communities, um, particularly in rural areas. Um, so community gardens can be a way that, um, you know, you can, you can collectively work to, to grow food um, that can satisfy nutritional needs. It's actually something that you know, can bring the, the community together and sort of shared work. Um, a lot of times these are um, done in places that were the, the, the land prior to that wasn't being used uh, much for anything um, really useful. So it can, it can have some aesthetic um, uh, benefits as well. Um, so, you know, that coupled with things like farmers markets, um, access to being able to, to use say snap cards to, to buy, to buy food in, in farmers markets. These are all parts of food infrastructure beyond you know, typical supermarkets and things like that that can expand access and um, have a, a broader array of foods. Thanks for that, Eric. Hey, there's uh, other questions that remain and um, they're good questions, but we are kind of out of time. Uh, we are at the end of our event and 
that's kind of the time that we promised our uh, audience members, panelists, all the staff involved that we'd be wrapping up. So we will respond to those questions and we'll uh, post them to the best of our ability on our city website. Uh, you can also, of course, come back and um, I guess you did see that raising your hand is a way to maybe jump in front of the line if you want the opportunity to have it answered here sort of uh, live. Um, so we would invite you to come back. Uh, we will have different panelists um, uh, at our next event, which is in one week from 10.30 a.m. till noon. Um, we'll have a similar type of format where we start with introductions. Uh, Jeff and I will give a similar type of overview. Then it'll jump into uh, panelist presentations with new panelists. Um, and so I really uh, encourage you to attend that and ask questions there. Pay attention, please, to our website, cityofcr.com slash sustainability. That's where you can take the survey. Uh, I'm going to go ahead here and just quickly share my screen back again uh, so I don't miss anything here at the end as we wrap up. And I'm going to jump back and get through here. So <laughs> this is our last survey question, actually. I almost forgot about this. Um, so this is to encourage the uh, survey taking, of course. So um, Sylvia, if you, you're still holding on after seven o'clock, could you go ahead and run this just quick? And this question is, when can you take the Community Climate Action Survey? We're hoping that you can. Um, so it is live at cityofcr.com slash sustainability. And we'd really encourage you to take it because that will help us understand priorities, connections. Um, the survey results will combine with assessment that our staff has been doing to make a conditions report that is both kind of technical, quantitative, but qualitative with your priorities. That report will be used to then share with the public, share with council and inform the climate advisory committee what type of work they should be doing as they get started. And so uh, we can probably just close this out. Aha, no one's taken it yet, which was expected, unless you're super ambitious. I will take it right up to the event, 11 of you. I don't know who you are, but I'm gonna hold you to it. And you'll take it soon, but not today. And those were our only three options. So thank you so much for participating. Mm -hmm. You did great. All of our panelists, thanks so much. Uh, Monica, Carla, Eric, Mark, we appreciate you taking the time working through all this. Uh, we had a lot of staff get us to this place. We have an awesome council that was ambitious enough to pass this and will be critical to leading this. And all of you audience members and many more connections that you'll help us make will be essential. We will be successful if we kind of work on this together. Um, so next time, 1030 to noon uh, on the 29th, we'll have Dar Schmidt with the library, Liz Callahan and a student from Cedar River Academy, Magisha Boingue with United We March Forward, and uh, Dave Osterberg, uh, Emeritus from the University of Iowa and founder of the Iowa Policy Project. So thanks for joining us tonight. This is recorded. It'll be posted. We'll respond to your questions. Please take the survey. And uh, thanks so much for being here tonight, everybody.